Hello, and thanks for listening. This is Vietnam Voices, a project of the Billings Gazette, sponsored by Masterlube, and it is 9-11-2015, at about 11.30. And I've got Carl Solberg in the Gazette studios with me. Uh, Carl served in the U.S. Army, has a, a, a fascinating story. What little I know about it, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it, Carl. And um, though you were in the Army from 64 to 67, I want to know, my first question is where were you before that? What, what, what was life before 1964? I was uh, born and grew up in a, a small town in northern Montana, Dodson, Montana. And uh, I think where it uh, began in my junior, junior high and high school years, where I, where I had a deep respect for veterans in the service was I was a trumpeter in the band. Okay. And uh, I was called on a lot to do to play taps at grade side services for for veterans at the grade side services in Dodson, Montana, and, and uh, I had it ingrained in my mind, and and I was set that I was going into the service right up up high school after graduation. Wow! And that's did, what I did, and no one would change my mind. I'm sure. Did anybody try to change your mind? Nobody tried to change my mind. Did you come from a military family? I did not. I had. Uh, Two brothers that were in the guards, and, uh, and one brother that served, uh, he was drafted and served some time in, in Germany, but that was it. Okay. So you knew, but in 64, we had advisors there, but we hadn't really fully, Vietnam wasn't full bore. Did you, did you know about Vietnam at the time? We did, but we didn't, from our perspective, we didn't hear much. Uh, we saw a few articles in the paper, uh, but... Th- there, there wasn't much happening in Vietnam from our point of view at, at that time. I, I know that there was, you know, when you, you study the history of what was going on. Uh, but uh, it was pretty quiet yeah. in words from, you know. So this wasn't um, some of the, the, the folks who were, the gentlemen who were over in Vietnam later said, yeah, we knew, we knew that thing, that the, it was a, it was a war, but when you you enli- uh, when you enlisted, you didn't know that what necessarily what you were signing on for. Well, it didn't take long. You know. first, <laughs> okay. First day, first day, in, at the reception center, it was mighty mighty. Tell, l- l- let's uh, let's talk about that first day at the reception center. Was it in Butte? Well, the physical was in Butte. Okay. Uh, I uh, we flew to uh, San Francisco, and uh, there's nothing too traumatic that. To me, at the reception center, that I uh, I can remember and recollect off offhand, uh, I just did what I was told and took one day at a time and yeah. and uh, rolled with the flow, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. What's the um, so you go to boot camp? Where, where did you do uh, boot camp? And then what was your basic in? I was in basic in in uh, Fort Ord, California. Okay. And uh, most all of us, of course. Uh, had training in infantry back at that time. Okay. And then uh, after training, I uh, was uh, transferred to Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland. And uh, at Edgewood Arsenal, Maryland, I was a courier to the Pentagon. Uh, back in those days, there was, uh, of course, uh, the computers weren't as, as uh, elaborate and as sophisticated as they are today, but the military the Army kept its strength reports, we kept the strength reports on, on uh, punch cards. And okay. it was my job to take these punch cards to, uh, to the Pentagon and we dropped them off at different places and, and I thought, you know, back in those days, the, most of my driving was done in the back roads of Montana, northern Montana on a gravel road and here I was, an 18 year old kid. Uh, career to the Pentagon, and I'm sure I have to smile about it now, and I'm sure uh, the, uh, the, the gentleman, at the motor pool sergeant who assigned me this old 1961 Ford Fairlane car stripped down, probably assigned me the bigger, biggest junker, junker he had in the motor pool. <laughs> um, I have to smile about that now, yeah. but uh, yeah. those were... D- how was driving in D.C. back then? Well, you... <laughs> Learn to adapt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm catching a theme here. I did. Yeah. Uh, so, what, what was the Pentagon like in 1964? I don't think there's been a, a lot of changes. Okay. Uh, my experience with the Pentagon 
we had it assigned to what entrance the, that I had to go and what particular parking lot that I had to go to and and the room numbers. Uh, there was a handful of different rooms where I, I, I dropped off these punch cards. Uh, uh, I don't think there was a much much difference than okay. probably it is today. Uh, it's huge, but I, I had to take my reports just to the my specific sections right. at the uh, Pentagon, and I thought, my stars forever. It's pretty important that the Army knows where their troops are being sent. So right, right. Uh, so this was, uh, yeah, this was important. Right. What, what, what do you remember from, uh, let, let's talk about your time at the Pentagon. What do you remember about just uh, the, just being in that environment or, or that kind of, those kind of duties and tasks? Um, I, the, the big thing that I, I noticed that walking up and down the halls of the Pentagon, there's certain mi military, strict military protocol that is always followed. Okay. Uh, respect for senior officers uh, is very important. Um, uh, you need to know, as a, a brand new recruit private, you need to know the proper protocol in military life uh, when you're calling on different offices. And okay, so give me an example. Um, they, uh, there's a certain order when, when officers come in and out of conference rooms and things, you know, and it, it's according to rank. Uh, your senior officer always walks on the right hand side of you, is what uh, the way it was when when I was there, uh, you're the lower ranking person, and you walk to their left. Uh, everything is yes, sir. Okay. Um, it's very, very. Uh, you try to be as tactful and as polite, and uh, showing as much respect as as possible. Okay. But that was. Did it was it a scary experience? No. Okay. No, not at all. Was it friendly? Very. Okay. Very friendly. Uh, the people were very accommodating. Uh, actually, it was a, a, a fun, pleasant experience. Right. It was. Even the 61 uh, Fairlane? Well, if you took the wrong exit and you ended up in some place in Arlington, Virginia, that was not fun. But. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but that really happened, right? It really did happen. <laughs> uh, did you, uh, so then after Pentagon, uh, after the Pentagon, then what happened? After the Pentagon, uh, I was assigned to uh, an artillery unit in Germany. And uh, we boarded the USS Simon B. Buckner, which was a World War II transport ship. And uh, we rode the Buckner, we took the Buckner. We were on the Atlantic for 28 days. Hmm. Um, and that was quite a, a fun experience, uh, the lower level of the of the ship, of course, we had canvas cots that were uh, stacked about four or five high. Hmm. Uh, I remember um, sleeping on the lower cot, and uh, I had the habit of sleeping with my arm hanging over the side. And of course, the person in the middle of the night got sick. I, oh. had, I had remnants of uh, his seasickness running down my arm, which. Wasn't. Did that cure you of sleeping like that? Or it, did. it did. <laughs> but uh, during the daytime, uh, I was assigned, all of us had to have jobs, of course. And I was assigned uh, to work on deck, and I assigned out tools, cleaning tools and equipment for the maintenance crew on the uh, aboard ship. And uh, I just had a pad and kept track of who's was assigned what tools, but the nice thing about that was I got to spend the entire 28 days out in the open fresh air, right on deck, instead of having to spend the whole day down below in some cramped quarters someplace where you didn't have good fresh air, Yeah, which was pleasant for me. Yeah, was it, was it smooth sailing those 28 days? It was. It was smooth sailing until we got, I remember the, the most treacherous part of the, the whole voyage was uh, through the English Channel. Uh, there seemed to be pretty rough waters in the English Channel before we got to Bremerhaven, Germany, but it, it, it wasn't uh, 
too unpleasant. Okay. What, what happened when you got to Germany? When I got to Germany, I was assigned to the 37th Field Artillery, which is located about 10 miles out of Munich in Dachau. Of course, everyone probably knows uh, about Dachau. And uh, the interesting thing about Dachau, you know, this was in 1966, and historically, uh, this wasn't too many years after World War II. And in, in 1966, uh, what, it, what they had done was they uh, converted, uh, if you remember, uh, Hitler had a SS training camp at Dachau along with the concentration camp. And we lived in the same barracks that Hitler's troops lived in during World War II. Hmm. And the interesting thing about that was, uh, I don't know why people didn't take the time or effort that right above the main entrance of the of our barracks you could still see the outline of the swastika mm. above the barracks and uh, at the front entrance way and, and going down the sidewalk of course all military installations have flagpoles and uh, below the flagpole still engraved in the in the concrete below the, on the base of the flagpole was the swastika Hmm. And again, that even had not been etched out. Um, there were, I lived and stayed at this, uh, we were at the 37th Artillery for 18 months. And uh, I think at that time I didn't even know that, of course, that eventually I would uh, end up going to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when I was at Dachau was probably my biggest concern about uh, Vietnam probably at that point because of what I had seen about the atrocities that had taken place in Dachau was becoming a prisoner of war hmm. in Vietnam. You were living in ground central of what it meant to be a prisoner of during of war. war. Yeah, of war. Uh, that had in certain respects be just a, a, an, a, it was something you couldn't escape. You were living right Could there. Not. And uh, they've turned, in fact, uh, the Dachau campus at that time was about 20 acres. And uh, the barracks that we lived in, it was about, um, I think, three, three floors, well-built, constructed building. Uh, uh, stone walls and stone floors, and I mean, would make a good bomb shelter, in fact. Yeah. It was well, well constructed. Uh, but it's been all turned into a, a museum now, I, I understand. Hmm. Uh, we went and toured and walked by, because this was just a short walking distance from our barracks, the uh, crematorium at Dachau and, and the prison. Uh, we walked to th that place. Uh, we didn't want to go over there a lot, but we have several times we walked over. Um, th at that time, the railroad tracks taking people there was still in place. Uh, I thought that you could still smell the odors of death when I visited. I don't know if that was a figment of my imagination or if that was true fact. And I had right. other people that, that said that as well, but I felt that you I could. could. Death, the death. I thought I could, but maybe it's not true. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's... Uh, that that's kind of a haunting place it to is. be assigned. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. The. Um, so, what were you doing? I mean, I, I don't want to. This may be a dumb question, but what's the army doing there? Uh, what are you the, doing there? The thirty seventh field artillery. It, it was uh, primarily training uh, artillery, uh, like the rest of the posts throughout Germany. Um, we were supporting, you know, uh, Germany, uh, uh, but m m most of the work that we did there was was training. They, uh, there was, everyone went out, went out to the field every year and so on. And uh, Right. Did you, so by this time, though, it's, it's well into 65, uh, 65, 66. About 1966. Okay. So you know Vietnam's happening now. I now, now. Did, did that weigh on you? I mean, you're in the Army, and now, now we've got a, a real kind of a, well, a, a real war kind of over there, and you're, you're in the Army. It, does, that, does that bother you? Do you think about that? 
We think about that, uh, but it, it didn't bother. I mean, again, my philosophy was do whatever you need to do, and, and uh, uh, certainly I, I didn't lay awake at night worrying whether or not I was going to go. I mean, that was the last thing on my mind about worrying. Um, by this time, you visit and you are in touch with people that have gone to Vietnam, and, and you hear stories of people in Vietnam, and uh, it wasn't uh, anything that personally was a concern to me. Uh, the, the concern, I think, that we had was get in there and clean up the mess and just get on with it. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what, what were the story? What, when people who had been over there, what, what kind of stories were they telling about Vietnam? Um, one per person comes to mind that uh, volunteered. He, it was still pretty much an advisory capacity. Okay. So they you're... were advisors, the ones that were going over at this time, the ones that I had any uh, association with, um, advising the, the Arvin. Yep. And, and so they were just, yeah, they were just advisors. Yeah. Support. Yeah. Exactly right. So when did you get notice that you were headed over there? I don't remember how I got notice, uh, but it was about, I think it was July. Um, it didn't take too long. And why I got notice, I don't know. I suppose they could see that I, I still had lo long enough time on my enlistment to put in a 12-month uh, tour in Vietnam. Um, I don't even remember how I was notified, other than um, my thought was, we got to get packed, and the more time, I was given 30 days delay en route to get from Germany uh, to uh, Vietnam. And uh, the more, the faster that I could get in and get out of there, the more time that I would be able to spend in Montana with family and friends. Um, so we flew, landed in uh, New York, and uh, it was like middle of the night, one or two in the morning, and uh, we I walked into this army terminal, and there were people everywhere, uh, sleeping on their duffel bags, and there was no way to get out of there, because then I learned that there was an airline strike, and, in the United States, oh, there's no airlines going out. And I thought, well, I can't stay here. I'm not getting anywhere. I, I got 30 days to get moving. So I just walked outside, and there was a Greyhound bus sitting outside. I did not even ask the driver where he was going. He was sitting there idling, and all I said was, how much? He says, $1.15. So I gave him $1.15. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I was in New Jersey. How could I be any farther away from Montana anyway? <laughs> right. I mean, getting out of that that place where I could figure out how to how to get to Montana would be better than sitting there. So, we ended up in Philadelphia. That okay. bus took me to downtown Philadelphia, and then when I got to Philadelphia, of course, it was easy to grab a to uh, purchase a uh, bus ticket for Billings huh. to come home. Huh. Uh, but of course. A good part of my my leave was spent on a Greyhound on, bus. On a Greyhound bus. How long does it take to get from Philadelphia to Billings on a Greyhound? Uh, about five days. That's Those, five days. That was that would seem to be five really long days. days. Five really long days, and you're pretty gringy when by the time. You yeah, <laughs> yeah, that can't be fun. Uh, was it? I mean, what was what was that trip like? You, oh, for many going through many states, we stopped at every little wide spot in the road. <laughs> yeah. Uh, many times it's it's not the the most pleasant people. Yeah. That come on and get off d during all of those wide spots in the road. Uh, yeah. But my time was clicking, so I. So you got home. Do it. I that is a great home. story. So uh, you got home, and then what did you do for the other twenty some days some and change? Hang out with friends and visit family and yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, and they all know you're headed to Vietnam, right? They all knew that I was headed to Vietnam. Did that tinge? Did that did that make it a a 
more somber occasion? Maybe for them. Okay. It didn't, uh, I, it was a fact of life for me. I think for family, probably it was more difficult for family members, mm -hmm. and I've thought about this a lot, probably more difficult for family members mm -hmm. if they had a son or daughter going to Vietnam than it was, than it was for those that went for me. Uh, by this time, you know, I don't know what it was for me. I became desensitized in a lot of ways. I don't know, it's a very hard thing for me to explain. Desensitized in that you don't have uh, a lot of concerns about whether you're gonna make it or not, or that kind of thing. Okay. I didn't have yeah. that kind of a concern whatsoever. Did you ever think about it? I was mostly worried about becoming a prisoner of war. Okay. That's worse, that, than, that's, that's worse than dying. Okay. Wow. Yeah, and you would know because you got to see firsthand what a prisoner I, of war camp. Well, POW, being a POW, that was yeah, huge in my mind. Yeah. So where did you go to Vietnam from? How did, how did you get? Now, now you're in Montana. Now how do you get? What's the route from Montana to Vietnam? Montana. We were... We flew, I flew to California, and uh, at that time, uh, the buildup, this was uh, when the huge buildup was taking place in Vietnam, and, and many times, most often, the military sent complete army units to Vietnam, all at, uh, as, a unit. as a unit. And uh, it must have been where my name was alphabetically, but I happened to be uh, the only person uh, flying out on that plane that was going to, to uh, the Mekong Delta. Every, everyone else on that plane were with the 101st Airborne Division. And uh, they were scheduled to fly to the northern part of the country. Uh, that's where their unit was located. And uh, I was going to the Mekong Delta uh, which is in opposite ends of the country, but we f I flew with 101st, we landed in Pleiku, up in the uh, northern part of the country. Uh, and uh, of course, the other, all of the people on board had full military combat gear. They were wearing a full combat gear, except me, I had my class A uh, khaki uniform. Um, and uh, I remember the, the, the thing that comes to mind was uh, stepping off the plane, raining like you would never believe, and stepping, stepping off the, uh, the runway and uh, sinking into mud up past your ankles, uh, red slimy mud up to your ankles. Um, and of course, I was cold and we got out of the rain the best we could and, and I was waiting for my flight to uh, go to Saigon um, and of course the others were going to, uh, to their unit um, and it seemed like a, a real long wait and we got, uh, I took a uh, military cargo plane from Play Coup to to Saigon, um, and uh, I was still cold and, uh, and wet. And uh, I remember looking up and seeing the, the gunner uh, wearing his 45 caliber and his pilot survival knife, and I was sitting on the bench there, uh, and I was cold, and it, by this time it was dark, and I thought to myself, uh, you know, <laughs> this is like a dream. Right. I, I remember specifically pinching my legs actually to see if it was really a, a dream or not. Yep, it was, it was true. Well, we uh, landed, it was uh, nighttime, and, and uh, as we were flying over the, uh, towards Saigon, I could see tracers down below. And I knew, of course, uh, every round is not a tracer, and it looked like uh, they were just coming up. Uh, and it, it looked like uh, they weren't reaching us from our altitude, but yet you know deep down that uh, the tracers more than likely burned out before uh, they reached their target. target. Um, 
but then uh, we landed in Saigon and uh, everything was pretty uneventful from that trip down to the to Canto and in the Delta. What did you remember about when you stepped off in Sa- so when you stepped off in Pleiku, it's it's muddy and rainy. Was Saigon the same way or was it different? It's rainy. Saigon, it wasn't. Well, of course, it's muddy when when uh, out off uh, when you get off the uh, airstrip a little ways. Uh, Saigon though was was the main uh, port one of the main ports, people coming in and out of the country, and uh, it was much more built up. Mm -hmm. It wasn't as primitive as it was where we had first landed. Mm -hmm. Um, It was nice and green, and I remember uh, flying over Saigon, and I thought, there can't be a war down here. Things look so nice and peaceful, and they're so green. Right. Uh, But you found out there was a war. There was a war. Huh. But it looked nice. I mean, I I had a, a, a... a helicopter um, gunner say Vietnam was just beautiful up up from high and there was no sound and it just looked was idyllic. I, yeah, I saw the same thing. Is uh, so Saigon's a little bit bigger, built up city, but you weren't you didn't stay in Saigon long. You went we to didn't. Con, uh, did, where did you did you go to Canto or where? Canto. Yep. And where? Uh, so describe how you get there and what what that's like. We took a helicopter. Um, from Canto, it's about 90 miles from Saigon to Canto. Uh, I was assigned to uh, 13th Combat Aviation Battalion, okay. um, and uh, our mission. It was one of our one of the few, if not probably the only uh, uh, unit which gave direct support to the Arvin uh, Army. Okay. Uh, we provided the uh, our Arvin. Army with assault ships, uh, troop transports. We had uh, slick helicopters, which is a helicopter with no uh, no munitions, and then uh, of course we had uh, assault helicopters. Right. <clears throat> so, what was your role when you were assigned to that? What was your what was your role on that? Well, I uh, did a, a couple of things. We were okay. cross trained and. I don't remember uh, receiving much training in Vietnam at all on s- s- too much specifics because I think it was on the job. <laughs> um, Sounds like there was a lot of on the job. I training. was uh, one one particular job that I did was I w- did a lot of CQ work, charge of quarter work. Charge of quarters is a person who stays awake, notifies, is kind of the communication link between uh, other people in, the, in, the, in your unit um, during non-working hours. And there I was, uh, by this time I was 19 years old, I thought, oh, you know, I have access to dispatching troops. <laughs> uh, I thought that was... Well, of course, there was a, a commissioned officer who was my immediate supervisor, and I was right. his uh, his helper, so to speak. Right. But they usually, uh, the charge of quarters officer usually w- was not around that much. Okay. What did you, so what's a, uh, what's an, I don't want to say exciting, because that means th- that might connote fun, but... What is a uh, what is a busy or an active night look like if you're in charge of quarters? What's charge of quarters? Um, well, I can just uh, I can uh, just give give one example uh, that that comes to mind. I remember getting a phone call and uh, there was some activity nearby, and uh, they needed donations of blood. And I remember, uh, of course, first of all, you call your supervisor, so you kind of brainstorm, and, and uh, he took the phone. And I remember going through the, the different hooches. It was like 3 o'clock in the morning and waking everybody up, and uh, they wanted as many blood donors as, as possible. Uh, I remember that happening. Uh, it was during the night time. 
it was very, very active. Yeah, because that's uh, when a lot of the, the, the attacks happened, exactly right? Exactly right, yeah. Was it scary? I wasn't afraid. I pretty much took one day at a time, so to speak. I right. wasn't. Uh, you just do what you need to do. And, and yeah, so you're kind of a... Uh, I'm sure you get aden- adrenaline rushes. I did. Yeah. No doubt about that. Yeah, yeah. So when you're, uh, what other things did you, were you basically charge of quarters for for the uh, for the the time that you were there, or did you do other? I did other things. Uh, I did other administrative jobs as well as uh, as a crew member okay. on being with a aviation okay. company. Uh, we t- took, of course, it these the choppers that we had. Uh, they were Hueys. Uh, we had uh, probably room on a helicopter for like about a dozen crew members. Okay. Uh, they were used for transport in and out uh, via Arvin troops. Yeah. What was it like? What was it like with the Arvin? Uh, because you got that. That's something that not a lot of people had experience with, or they may have been an advisor once, but but actually working to support Arvin. What was that like? I had a lot of respect for them. I. Uh, I didn't see anything adverse that happened, but I heard stories, which I don't know how true those stories are, stories about them from time to time being reluctant to get out of the, get out of the helicopter mm-hmm. and had to be forced out of the helicopter. I didn't see it. I don't know if that's even true, mm-hmm. but uh, I heard stories about that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, so you were doing transport in and out. Were you also supporting them if they uh, would you would you support them on a combat if, if they if they ran into the fire? You would have to go and and, and try to try yes. to help them out. Correct. And is are they fighting down in the Mekong Delta? Are they fighting NVA? Or are they are they fighting uh, Viet Cong? Viet Cong and and uh, North Vietnamese. Uh, that's a strange thing, or the interesting thing about the Vietnam War. Uh, you didn't know really who your enemy was. Right. There was no front lines in Vietnam, um, and consequently, you watched who you talked to and what you said. Especially if these were Vietnamese, correct? correct. That's a dis- was that a disconcerting feeling, or how did? You- and what was the communication like? Because did they speak English or did you speak Vietnamese or how did you? I couldn't speak any Vietnamese. Okay. They spoke English. Uh, it was broken English. You, uh, we spoke in short, choppy sentences mm-hmm. uh, with a combination of gesturing and, and speaking in short, choppy sentences. You pretty well you could communicate. And uh, I know that uh, there were interpreters, probably too, but I didn't have any exposure to, with any Vietnamese interpreters. Huh. So uh, you're you're in their country, and we are their guest. And you're their guest, and yet you're helping them. You're helping them fight for their for their country, ostensibly. Correct. Is this uh, when you go to let's let's talk about when when you're supporting them. Um, most of the time when you're supporting them, are they taking fire? Are they battling, or are you just doing um, slicks in and out of, or, or what? They are taking, they are taking battle as you, as you are as well. Uh, what is battle, uh, is it, is it jungly? What, what, what's the terrain like with that you're fighting on? Well, the Delta is swampy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the interesting thing about it is back then, I don't know if this is true today, about two thirds of the food supply in Vietnam is grown in the Delta. So uh, the, there's a lot of vegetation, there's a lot of swamps and rivers, and uh, a lot of hiding places for Charlie. Mm-hmm. Uh, our choppers usually, you know, I don't want to go into any, very much any specifics, but uh, what comes to my mind was flying at treetop level. Uh, Viet Cong in sampans mm-hmm. floating on the river. Mm-hmm. Uh, they hear you, and uh, I see and visualize and saw the, them jump out of their sandpans and breathe through reeds. 
under the water so they can keep out of your sight. Hmm. Um, but wow. th those memories, those memories are pretty much gone. I block yeah. those out if I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, w uh, when you're, what is the, w it, you're fighting with helicopters. So it's, uh, and I'm assuming when the guns go off, is this a pretty loud environment that you're it in? It is. Okay. Um, like I say, we're floating at, uh, flying at treetop level and uh, you can, you can see very well, but of course you fly at that level because you can't be sighted as right. from such a, a great distance. Uh, and I, one of the things that the Vietnam, uh, almost all Vietnam vets say is they love, whether it was uh, the Viet Cong or the, or the NVA, they just loved shooting at anything in the air. So that a lot of the, the helicopters were targets. Is that, a, is that an accurate? I say that's very, very accurate. Uh, and um, it's accurate. Uh, one of the, I've never ever said this, and I don't want, I don't like to even talk about it, but I, I guess I can say it at this point, and that is the most difficult for me to, to say and see was the color of the water as it changed from a, a muddy, dirty water to splotches of red mm -hmm. when they were fired upon. Yeah. Other than that, I, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. What is the, um, uh, is, is, are you, so are you fighting side by side with them, the, the, the Arvin? I mean, are you, are you side by side or do you do, do you go in at, do you go in as, as Americans? Are you, who are you side with? Side by side. They, hmm. they ride our helicopters. helicopters. We take them in and we take them out. Was there any animosity between the two sides? I troops? didn't see it. Okay. I did not see it. Okay. What do you miss about home? You're a long way. This is the Mekong Delta is not Montana. I'm. What What do you miss about Montana? Well, uh, you know, I never really th thought of that point. Uh, hmm. The big thing that I missed: good food, yeah, cold milk to drink, uh, good tasting water. Okay. Uh, the water there was I not good tasting. The water there was terrible, very bad. Okay. Uh, the food and the water and the the cold milk. Yeah. Um, what, did you think about what you were going to do when you got home? You talked about it all the time. Okay. What did you? So when you said, "I when I get home, I will," how would you fill that we over? And we didn't use the word "when I get home." We okay. used the word "when we get back to the world." Okay. So you weren't in the world. We were not in the world when we get back to the world. Okay, we so were, when you get back to the world, you were going to? We were going to go to school, and we are going to buy a new car. Right. And uh, play with friends. and Yeah, just have a good the, time. Yeah. Right, right. I want to, uh, I want to, uh, um, what kind of communication are you getting from home? Are you, are you writing letters? Are you getting letters? Are you, what, is there correspondence between you and your family and friends? There is, there is. Uh, I thought it was very important that I keep in touch closely and I tried to write at least one letter per day to some family member. Mm. I felt that to be really important. I knew also that it was, I think, harder on family than it probably was on us back there. Mm -hmm. uh, they hear the news and they hear what's going on and I'm sure that's, that's startling. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I got home, I learned that, that my dad, sitting at his kitchen table uh, on the wall nearby was a map of Vietnam. And as he heard the news, he uh, always referred to his map so he could keep up with what operations were taking place in Vietnam at that time. I thought that was kind of interesting, but I, I think it was definitely harder for them than it was for me. Sure. Way harder. Huh. I do. What, uh, I, I have to come back to one of the things that you said. What, what, what was the food like in, in Vietnam? Uh, if you ate at the uh, enlisted men's, went to an enlisted man's club, you could have decent hamburgers and french fries. Uh, I don't, institutional army food. Right. A lot of it out of a can. Yep. Uh, opening a can of uh, chicken noodle soup with a P38 
eating that cold, and then your P38, as you open up the can, you see metal shavings and skim on the top of the grease of the, the chicken noodle soup, and you're eating that cold. Do, must I say any more? No, no, I, it doesn't sound uh, very appealing. Uh, what is, uh, what's an average day like over there for you? Give, walk me through just what's a kind of, for you, what was it like? My, when I was CQ, my evening, my day started uh, after five, so it was a lot of night work. Okay. Uh, you sleep in the day if you can. How do you sleep? Sleep in your bunk like everyone, I guess. Do you sleep? I mean, is it hot? It seems like it would be it's hot. Very in hot. You crawl under your in your bunk and bring the mosquito net down, keep the mosquitoes away, and and try. Do you try? Yeah. Are you taking? Uh, are they firing on your camp? Do you take any of that? Or are you far enough back? Uh, nighttime, mortar okay. attacks were not uncommon. Uh, every every night after dark, you would hear skirmishes. Different, different areas in your perimeter every single night. Uh, you just block it out. Hmm. It's just it's the like, background. It's like the Fourth of July every night, but you block it out. You just wow. It's the life. That's when, the way it was for me. Right. No, I, I think that that's true for a lot of people. When you uh, does that make? I've had a few people since you brought it up. The Fourth of July. Uh, I've had more than a few vets say they really don't enjoy it because it, it's too much like back then. It is. Um, you, there are some things you never, ever forget. The 4th of July can be bothersome. Uh, there's other things that can be, too. Okay. Uh, the sound of helicopters is really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Last week, I went to a Mustangs game in a hospital chopper. I heard a hospital chopper overhead. Uh, I felt my heart race. I had to get up and go get a drink of water. Yeah. Uh, those things never leave. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Well, tell me, uh, one of the interesting things I want to talk to you about is tell me what you did in spare time. If there was, I mean, I know that's probably a, uh, not not the right word, but forgive me my clumsiness. Uh, what did you do when you weren't working? I, of course, I, I didn't. I wasn't interested in doing a lot of the things that a lot of people like to do, drinking beer and carousing, and uh, that did not interest me at all. Um, our chaplain in, at Canto referred me to folks at an orphanage at Canto. Okay. Um, there were several hundred children in this orphanage, and of course these were all children who lost their parents in the war. And uh, I spent countless hours volunteering at this orphanage. Um, we did things such as building playground equipment, digging post holes and putting up swing sets and uh, filling lots of sandbags because we wanted a perimeter around this whole, uh, or the entire orphanage to keep the kids safe from what was going on outside. Uh, and when I uh, worked, and volunteered at the orphanage, there was this little nine-year-old boy, his name is Kim Hung. He kind of became my buddy and, and uh, we kind of hung out together back there. Okay. Tell me about, uh, so I, I, I just want to stop because it's, it's a profound point. You're over there in a war, in a war zone, combat, and yet you're also volunteering at a orphanage. That's pretty remarkable hmm. Carl that's well. pretty remarkable um, what are children uh, that that's a lot of children there a lot of children what's it like what's the orphanage like um, they're the age range in age from babies to nine and ten year olds uh, this orphanage was uh, run by the Catholic Church, and there were Vietnamese uh, Catholics uh, Viet and nuns who were the administrators here. Okay. Um, I didn't see it to be any different than orphanages just anywhere else, except there was a lot of children, yeah. a lot of children. Kind of a demonstration of war? It was. It was, and uh, a demonstration of poverty, they had nothing. Uh, 
the little boy, Kim, who had uh, kind of uh, taken a liking to me and I to him, um, he, his family, I know, I, I knew, came from, from a very, it was a very poverty-stricken uh, home. Uh, they had one bicycle. That was their only mode of transportation for the entire family. And uh, when I bought a used bike for Kim, he thought he was probably the richest person in an orphanage because he had his own bike. And that was something that uh, was unheard of for many of those children there. Hmm. Wow. Uh, poverty was, um, and they appreciated, the children appreciated anything and everything that was given to them. Even uh, a cookie f from your care package from, that was, came from home. Uh, wow. They lavished that. Yeah. And that made it worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that gives you kind of a unique perspective on Vietnam uh, than when you worked with the, the kids. It did. And uh, uh, that, that was a good time? I mean, that was a it good... It was a good time. What, it really passed the time quickly. Yeah. Uh, you say, you know, why would you even like to do this? Uh, what else was there to do? Sit and feel sorry for yourself or do something constructive yeah. uh, and do something fun. And, and actually, some of those, those children were like only 11 or 12 years younger than I myself. Right. So, so these are almost like little, little brothers or sisters, sisters not, 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 just, uh, not just kids. Mm -hmm. um, did, they, did they treat you differently? No. I don't, I don't think so. Yeah. I, the children there, they were respectful, very respectful. They sh appeared to enjoy having you around. Mm -hmm. uh, you asked me, you know, why would you want to volunteer? When you, uh, when you walk up to the main gate and you see a nine-year-old Vietnamese boy seeing you and they come running to come meet you, because they know when they see you that you'll do something fun, um, that makes it worthwhile to me. That made it worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about Kim, because it was hard. It must have been hard when you left Vietnam. It must have been really hard leaving that because I'm not not leaving the war, but but you you, mm -hmm. you knew that you were leaving behind kids. I um, they gave us a day or so what we called to clear post. That means. Get all your affairs in order and you get your things shipped, ready to ship and ship back to the country. So when I was uh, on my last day, when I was clearing post, I uh, went to the orphanage and I had to tell Kim my goodbye. And of course, when I spoke to Kim, I spoke in short, choppy sentences. And I, I said, Kim, I said, Kim, I leave. I go to America to see my mama son and my papa son. And uh, I could see the expression instantly uh, change in him. And he clung on to my army. He says, he called me Sergeant. He says, Sergeant, I go to America with you. Sergeant, I go with you. I says, no, Kim. And then he, he was clutching harder and then, of course, he was crying. And, and then the, uh, the workers there at the orphanage saw the, the dilemma that I was in and they came and took Kim and uh, took him away and, and and then, of course, he watched me leave, and he was crying, and I never saw Kim after mm. that. Hard for you? Well, I thought about him, wondering <laughs> how he was doing or if he was still, uh, still uh, alive. He would be, wow, he would probably be in his mid-50s now. Huh. Wow. That, that, uh, did, uh, do you think for you, is, is, was Vietnam a good thing? Vietnam was, I think, a good thing. I hope. Okay. I hope that it paved a way for me to better myself, to be a positive contribution to society. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. I think it did that. Yeah. Uh, I hope it did that. Yeah. What's the happiest memory you have from Vietnam? Wow. Probably coming home. Yeah. Yeah, tell me about let's let's talk about that homecoming. What, what was home coming home uh, like for you? I uh, we landed in California. It was late at night. 
I was craving good cold milk to drink. And I remember uh, coming off the plane and the first thing that they did for us was they cooked us a steak dinner. There was a lot of people coming home from Vietnam back then. And this army mess hall, so all the cooks did was cook steaks for for people. Wow, that's, that's quite a job. Up. That, that yeah. tells you how many people, Just all like, you do is cook steak all and, the time. And, uh, oh boy, that was, that was good. That was yeah. a good steak. And, and, then, and my other memory that I had was that we, I was sitting and enjoying the steak and we were going to the, to the, uh, keep refilling my glass of milk and drinking more and more. And I remember the, the kitchen worker had to replenish the, the milk. And I remember I, in filling the milk machine again, I remember him spilling milk. And a lot of this good milk was being wasted and spilled right. on the floor. You, you were crying over spilled milk? I was crying <laughs> over spilled. And there was a, in that whole mess hall, when that happened, there was silence. You know, there was visiting and you hear the conversations of people going on uh, and, and visiting and having a, uh, a good conversation. And when that milk spilled, it was silent. Because I think everybody was thinking the same thing that I was like, thinking. Like, oh, yeah, you'd just been a whole year without uh, and then I'd see that on the floor. being spilled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So then where? From from California after the steak dinner, then what? Ha then, then you're done, right? You're I about was done. The first thing that I did, I, could, I hurried up and got myself a a room so I could get out of my uniform and put civilian clothes on. Because back then you did not walk the streets in San Francisco with an wearing an army uniform. Uh, I didn't want to put myself in an uncomfortable situation, so that's the very first thing that I did. And then I, uh, I had made contact with a brother, a younger brother who flew to San Francisco and we met at San Francisco and uh, the rest was history, coming home. Yeah, was that pretty uh, coming home? That must have been a good feeling. It was an eventful. Yeah. Um, of course, you had plenty of time. Right. Plenty of time to think about what kind of things you're gonna do going to school and what kind of car you're going to buy. And I had all those plans in my mind. And uh, we were gonna buy a car on the way home. Uh, and I was gonna buy a Volkswagen Carmen Ghia in Eugene, Oregon. I knew exactly where I was going to buy it. And my brother and I, we were going to take that car and we we're going to vacation a little bit more and finally head towards Montana. That's another story. Sounds like a fun one. <laughs> did you get to do all those things? I, I very did. Uh, you bought the Carmen Ghia? You won't believe that no. transaction. Well, when I was in Vietnam, it, it didn't take much money to live. So all the money, the little that we made in those days, the combat pay and your wages and so on, are sent home. So I had a, a pretty good account in the bank. And uh, that was going to be going towards a, a new car in college. So we walked into the Volkswagen dealer in Eugene, Oregon, and I saw this yellow Volkswagen Carmen Ghia on the showroom floor. My brother, he was like an eighth grader, and I was like this time, I was probably maybe 20 years old. I walked into the Volkswagen garage, and I said, sir, I didn't even look at it. I knew that's the car that I wanted. I want that. I want to buy that car. It was on the showroom floor in Eugene, Oregon. And he thought, oh, I was a spoofing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't serious. I was just a couple kids. They're just, just blowing hot hair. I'm sure what he was thinking. He says, really, come on into my office. I sat down in his office. I says, yeah. I says, I will have the money wired here for that. So I called my banker in, Mont in Malta, Montana. I still kid him about this <laughs> when I see him. I, and his name is Ron. I says, Ron, I told him who I was. I got this, I found this car and uh, I want to buy it. I don't remember, it was like, 20, back then, 67, about $2,700 and something. And uh, I says, Ron, I want to buy this. Would you send some money up here? Wire some money up here? And Ron says, no, just write a check. 
I says, Ron, I don't even have a checking account. He says, write a check. Uh, and so I thought to myself, you better talk to the salesman about this. He's not going to believe it. Right. So I handed the phone to the salesman. And of course, they were talking. And sure enough, uh, he, the salesman handed, uh, <laughs> ended the conversation. And we took a check from the, a blank check, counter check from the Eugene Bank, crossed off the, the name of the Eugene Bank, and we wrote down the name of our bank and wrote the check for 2700 and something odd dollars, and I signed it and gave it to him. And he held it, which is probably about two weeks later. Right. I, he held it there at the bank until we came and opened up a checking account. Huh. That was the 60s. That'll never happen anymore. Right. And so did you get to drive away in that Carmen Ghia? I, got, I drove away in that Carmen Ghia. Yeah. I did. Do you still have that car? I wished I did. Yeah, we we all have cars like that in our lives. Did you? So you you, you how was? Let's talk about how was um, getting back to to civilian life because you'd been out of civilian life for a while. What was what was that like? What was reentry like? What was readjustment? It was. Uh, we met up with friends and uh, our our. Uh, I didn't seem to have any any problems. I had my plans on on. Uh, I was going to go to school. Okay. Uh, and I already had a date set, and I had already so where did registered. You, okay. uh, I went to, the first two years I went to Dawson College. I, because it had been three years since I'd been out of school, I, I was a little concerned whether or not I could, could handle the rigors of, of college life. And I wanted to kind of ease into it. So I went to Dawson, where all the credits would transfer to MSU. Um, in, that's that's what I did with, uh, went two years there and on to MSU. Okay, and you got a degree in what? In in business. Okay, so what? Um, so you didn't have any of the the necessarily the problems readjusting. Was it hard to pick up your life, or was? I remember one time. I remember it was August, about the first week of school. I was sitting in the English class, and it was kind of warm in Glendive. I think the end of August or the first of September, uh, I was sitting in Eng my very first English class at at Glendive, and the d windows were open, and I remember a plane flying over Dawson College broke the sound barrier, and everybody was studying, doing their English assignment. It was very quiet in this classroom, and I couldn't control. I just said, "Boy, that was close." Boy, I was embarrassed after that. That's just something that spurted out. Boy, that was close. I don't know how or why. Or yeah. That was my probably my first uh, experience in classroom, exciting experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were there more? There was no more. Yeah. Did you when when you're over in country? What uh, to me, what's sometimes. Um, my memories are sometimes built around the sensory. Sights, smells, sounds. You, you mentioned helicopters. What, what other sensory, when you think of Vietnam, what comes to your mind or the memory from from a sensory perspective? What comes to mind was dirty water and rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, the, the, nothing really to me smelled really good in Canto. They have these opened open markets. Uh, in, Meat would be sold out in an open marketplace with flies and things for hanging around, and uh, because of the refrigeration, there just wasn't any refrigeration. Uh, of course, that didn't smell good. Uh, our uniforms. Uh, we had a uh, lady for not very much money washed our our uniforms, and uh, she would wash our uniforms and rub them on rocks down in the Mekong River. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, they, and of course, she'd fold them up nice, and, and they looked good when they were on our bunk. But in that kind of climate, you don't have to wear them very long. It was a sour, really sour smell. Your clothes never, ever smelled good. Mine never did. Hmm. Uh, that sensory comes to my mind very much. Yeah, yeah. Did you, uh, when, uh, 
when you're when you got home, did people think that you had changed, or were you were you the no same? No one Carl? said. No one said. Do you think you changed? Oh, everybody changes. Sure. I'm I'm absolutely positive. It was it. Uh, there were good things and bad things about those changes? I think so. Okay. I don't know what what they would be, but other than I, I hope there's more good than there are bad. Yeah. Yeah. Did uh, you, You've got this great picture of of your uh, of you, of your grandson wearing your where you're wearing your army dress green jacket. Um, what what do you tell kids or family members about your time in Vietnam? I don't they tell ask? them very much. Okay. I told more today than I have told in 45 years. Wow, I really, I really appreciate that. What is, um, what do you hope people looking back, and not, not, you know, part of the reason we're doing these interviews is not just for today, but in 50 years when people, when it becomes the hundredth anniversary of combat troops, I want people to be able to hear voices and to hear stories from that and not mm -hmm. just read from it in a, in a textbook. What do you want them to know about Vietnam that uh, from a person who was over there? We went uh, with uh, an objective in mind. Uh, oftentimes the political nature of the war, that didn't come to my mind, to our minds, I don't believe. We went there to uh, accomplish what we were asked to do. Mm -hmm. Whether you agree with the politics of it or not, we were asked to do that and, and we were committed to do that and we felt it was our responsibility to do that. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Yeah, no, that's, when, when you were over there, because you were working the, the, the head, the communications and the, uh, did you have to do, you know, one of the things that I've always heard about is guard duty, pull guard duty and all that. Did you have to do that? Well, if, when I was CQ, I didn't have to uh, do it. That kind of took the place of it, but I did, mm -hmm. uh, not that much, several times, maybe three, four times. What is that like? It was... It was easy when I was pulling okay. guard duty. I, uh, nothing happened uh, that was too right. frightening, but it, uh, I'm sure it would concern me at the time, but it doesn't, it's doesn't. nothing I really remember that had much impact. Yeah, yeah. When you, uh, when you look back on, on now, uh, that's been a long time ago, uh, Vietnam, uh, uh, for the, uh, a lot of history has passed. Do you look at the Vietnam? Do you look at Vietnam differently today than you did then? I don't. Okay. Uh, I thought sometimes that I'd like to go back. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I might go back. I would. Maybe that could be a goal eventually. Yeah. Would you? Would you, why would you like to tell me a little bit? What? Why would you like to go back? I'd like to see some of the places and see how they changed and go to our army base, uh, our post and see what the new terminal looks like and uh, maybe see some of these backwards, backwoods places that we saw from the air and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and see what opinion they have now yeah. about our being there. Yeah. I don't think, I don't know if that, that will ever happen or not. I, I'm not too keen on climates that are muggy and hot and rainy, and yeah. if we don't have to. <laughs> I can see that. Was it was it shocking to you when you got to San Francisco that you know you, you took off? You you wanted to find a place that you didn't put on your uniform. Was that a shocking occasion for you? It was. It, it made me mad, and I just avoided those knotheads that were protesting. That's yeah. the way that I felt. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know about that when you were over in country? I so did. so you were aware enough that, you know, both politically there had been some souring, but then publicly this was not this was not something that people were were uh, or not all people. I I won't I don't want to make broad categorizations, but there was some opposition to that. So you knew about that. I did. I did. Did other so if you knew about it other troops did. What what did that do to to people over there at the time? Uh, it I think it lowered morale. It mm -hmm. was a, a huge morale uh, killer. problem and killer. That's exactly right. Yeah. Hmm. 
Um, but I, again, it's one of those, I kind of blocked it out of my mind. Uh, that's the other side of the world. Yeah. That's somebody else's opinion. Uh, yeah. They can, they're entitled to their opinions, and I kind of left it at that, I think. Yeah. Did you join, when you came back and, and you, you, you got on with, you got to the real world, uh, the, did you, did you join VFWs? Did you, American Legion, anything like that? Did you have any contact with any of the, your fellow veterans and I, brothers? Uh, I, I send in dues to VFW. I'm a, a life member of the Disabled, Vet, Disabled American Veterans Organization. I, I, uh, I, I'm not really active doing okay. that. I've, I'm doing another kind of volunteer work uh, rather than participate in veterans uh, mm -hmm. organizations. They're, mm -hmm. they're good groups. Right. Really good. Yeah. Were you injured in Vietnam? I was. I Well, about seven years ago, I was diagnosed with the Agent Orange-related cancer. Okay. And uh, I have been cancer-free now for seven months, okay. or seven years, rather. And uh, the uh, VA did, uh, I have glowing things to say about those folks. They uh, saved my bacon. Yeah. Did you, um, what, what do you, what, so you, you get out of Vietnam, you go on with your life, and then years later, 30 years later, mm -hmm. Agent Orange comes back. That's got to be a, a pretty bad feeling, not only just with the cancer, but knowing that it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's related to that. How did you deal with that? Well, when I was diagnosed, the doctor told me, that and uh, bless their hearts, they were they're willing. I could go to any any cancer center in the VA system. So they gave me two weeks to decide what we're going to do. We're, we're going to have to have some some treatments here. And um, so we, my wife and I, went home and discussed it. Uh, and I thought, well, maybe the thing to do would be to to uh, go to one of the major regional cancer centers and be treated there like Minneapolis or Denver or Seattle. And that's kind of what we had in our minds. So we went back to the doctor and discussed that and I told him probably this is what we would do. And uh, the, my uh, physician at that time said, well, you can do that. You go to, and, and we can see that that happened in Minneapolis or Seattle or Denver. Uh, however, if you are treated here in Montana at Helena, uh, Fort Harrison and Helena, I know who your surgeon will be. I know his success rate. I know his abilities personally. Uh, if you go to a regional center in, in some other place, it may be an intern or it might be a, a medical school kind of situation. You don't know who's going to be doing it. So it's your choice uh, what you want to do. But I know what I would do, he said. So of course, I followed his advice. And that's what we did. And it was a good choice. They were awful good to me. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, my wife, they had a very, very nice guest house across the street. Uh, while I was in the hospital, they, uh, my wife stayed at the guest house and was able to come visit every day. And uh, they were very, very good to us. Yeah. Yeah. Is it, um, is it haunting that, that, uh, to think that, okay, I, I got out of Vietnam, I survived and, and now it's come back through Agent Orange, and no. did, did you did you think about Agent Orange as no. news reports? So that that's all. We, they found out later yeah. the consequences of a, Agent Orange. Yeah. Uh, in the later years, they didn't know the consequences and the, the cancer-causing agents yeah. that it was at that time. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, it comes back to bite you later. Yeah, yeah. Did you? Um, uh, uh, how did? Uh, you said that Vietnam made you uh, hopefully a, a better. Uh, that you said I'm I'm gonna do things for good. How did that play out in your life after Vietnam? What well, are you proud of? Well, I uh, I spent 25 uh, years. First uh, out of college, I I uh, took a vocational position in Idaho for six years before coming to Montana, and, and uh, after coming to uh, Montana, I worked about. Uh, 25 years plus with a uh, social service agency uh, and uh, 
hopefully that was a contribution, that was a positive mm -hmm. contribution for people that uh, are less privileged than we are. Uh, yeah. I like that fact of being able to assist somebody that needed yeah. the help. Yeah. You know, one of the things that uh, the, the, this series, I think, hopefully does good things, but one of the things, um, Carl, that, that's really hard about is, is I, you know, I'm trying to take years of people's lives and boil them down into one small interview, and that's probably not going to be wholly successful. But w are there things about your experience, um, whether it's in Vietnam or with, the, or, or just in general, that I have missed that are important to your story that need to be told? No, I don't believe so. Uh, I guess all I can say is my, uh, my probably my biggest fear at that time, like I mentioned, was being a prisoner of war. Mm -hmm. uh, but the positive side of it is, and I said this before, I hope my experience there uh, paved the way to help me be a better protective citizen. And I just hope that that's the way of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think so. Uh, 25 years in social services, uh, yeah. uh, that, that's, another, that's another honorable thing, too. So, well, I just want to say thank you for sharing your story and also thank you for, for being willing to, to serve. Thank you. Yeah. My privilege. Well, it's been my honor to talk with you. So this has been Vietnam Voices.